Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us uh, for this Brennan Center for Justice program. My name is Nia Malika Henderson, and I am a senior political analyst at CNN and so delighted to be joined today by Sasha Eisenberg, who's written a fantastic book. His book is called The Engagement, America's Quarter Century Struggle Over Same-Sex Marriage. And before we dive into our conversation with Sasha, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, We'll leave time for questions after we chat with uh, Sasha. You can uh, dive into the question and answer box uh, and we'll hope to get it to as many of your questions as possible. And we're also going to provide a live closed captioning for this event. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we'll tell you a little bit about the Brennan Center. It's a nonpartisan law and policy institute that works to repair, revitalize, and when necessary, defend our systems of democracy and justice. We're grateful to our partners for this event, NYU's John Bradymus Center, which advocates for civil debate in politics and public policy. And on to this program this afternoon, which I'm delighted uh, to be here for the last couple of days of Pride Month. Happy Pride Month to everybody. Uh, on June 26, 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Obergefell versus Hodges that state bans on gay marriage were unconstitutional. I know I remember where I was when this decision came down. It was such a momentous day. And that decision made same-sex unions legal across the United States. But the road to that momentous decision was much longer than many of us know. In this definitive account, author Sasha Eisenberg vividly guides us through same-sex marriage's unexpected path from the unimaginable to the inevitable. And I'll tell you a little bit about Sasha, who I've known for many years. Uh, Sasha Eisenberg is the author of three previous books on topics ranging from the global sushi business to medical tourism and the science of political campaigns. He is the Washington correspondent for Monocle and has also written for New York Magazine and the New York Times Magazine. So good to have you here. Sasha, welcome to the Brenner Center for this event. Thanks. It's great to be talking with you about this, Nia. So, Sasha, you know, we kind of outline the different books uh, you've written over the last many years. Why did you want to write this book? Yeah, I came up with the idea um, in 2011, sort of two things happened. One, I was writing, working on a book about the science of political campaigns and uh, as you know, uh, noted. And I had just a lot of conversations over the course of that year with pollsters or people who dealt with public opinion in some form or another. And over and over again, they would uh, observe to me that they had never seen opinion on a single issue the way that they had seen it move on on marriage. And nobody had a really good explanation for me as to why that was. And as somebody who'd written a, uh, you know, a bit about political campaigns, that's how you and I met. Um, I, 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 uh, and understood the difficulty of persuasion. Um, that really stuck with me as an interesting puzzle. And uh, and at the same time, it was in the summer of, of um, 2011, actually almost uh, uh, 10 days ago, I think this week, uh, the New York State Senate voted to pass uh, a marriage bill, which Governor Cuomo then signed into law almost immediately. New York became the first um, big state to legalize marriage through the legal processes, uh, sorry, through the political process, as opposed to um, uh, via the courts. And that's was the first moment that I, as somebody who had, had uh, been covering politics, but had never written about this issue in any real way, um, came to think that sort of we had turned a corner and, and, and now I felt like there's only one way that this was going to end. I think there was a real open question beforehand. Um, and it seemed to me um, that, that, uh, that we'd re that we were approaching consensus as a country. And so, you know, I had been um, really formative for me as, why some part of why I do what I do, I think was reading like a lot of big books about the civil rights movement that had been written mostly by journalists starting in the late mid to late seventies. Um, and it seemed to me we were getting to the point in the arc of this, people were already starting to talk about the marriage fight as like the defining civil rights battle of our generation. And it seemed to me that, um, that you could start to look back and I wanted to know where this thing had come from, how it, how we got from wherever there was to wherever here was. And, and, um, and so it seemed to me that, that, that I could use some of those same tools to, to, to write an early version of this history. And you mentioned what happened in New York and, and what you saw over the last many years leading up to this momentous decision in 2015 was it unfolded at both 
state and local levels and the national level as well. You think about DOMA in 1996, then you move to 2004, Massachusetts legalizes same-sex marriage. Well, then also in 2004, you have the fight against same-sex marriage with these ballot initiatives uh, in I think 11 different states. Some people say, you know, that was pivotal and crucial for George Bush to regain the presidency in 2004. Talk about that dynamic and the kind of competing interests, competing sort of for same-sex marriage and, and against same-sex marriage and how that played into the larger dynamic. Yeah, I mean, so it's a, you know, it's a remarkable uh, uh, topic to write about. I mean, the title of the book is The Engagement, which, you know, I, I first had because I thought this book would come out at a time when we had basically as a country committed to this idea but hadn't actually uh, uh Cross the threshold into in, into full marriage equality, um, but you know obviously it, it it also is about conflict. Fundamentally, this is about how how political conflict emerges around a new issue and grows and spreads. And as you point out, it's conflict that took place in the legal sphere, in courts, and in the political sphere, legislatures, executive branch decisions, and um, through ballot measures, state level and federal level in almost every state concurrently at any point, what's notable is that there were people who were on both offense and defense. So there were, you know, in, in states there were simultaneously people thinking, is there a, a vehicle, an avenue to legalize same-sex marriage here? And then also people who are trying to ban it through statute or through constitutional amendments. And that's really unusual if, you know, when we think about the other sort of big civil rights, social justice movements in the United States, there, there were, there was nobody who was, you know, during the suffrage movement, there wasn't an aggressive effort to take away the vote from women in states where they had already won it. There was not an effort to expand Jim Crow in 1950 and 1955 and 1960. There weren't states that, um, that, that allowed African-Americans to vote that wanted to take away voting rights. So in, in that case, it was, you know, we, there was a, a force and then there was just resistance to change. In this case, both sides are pushing for different forms of change. And so it becomes this really interesting chessboard um, where, you know, all 50 states in the District of Columbia are sort of being fought over uh, by local and national players in, in different ways. And, and people have to coordinate their strategies to contend with how state and federal policy action in the in the political and legal spheres will we'll interact. And you, you mentioned some of the other fights for civil rights, women's movement, the civil rights uh, movement for the expansion of rights for African-Americans in the 50s and 60s. Um, what ways were those fights similar and different from the fight for same-sex marriage? I think mean, one big one is that those were carefully plotted over decades where obviously not everything went according to plan, but there was a, you know, starting in, you could probably go back to Seneca Falls, but certainly starting in the 1870s, there were women who declared winning the vote nationally as a goal and then built a strategy that un, un, unspooled over, you know, 50 years to figure out how you get to a point where you win the vote nationally, you know, uh, NAACP legal defense fund attorneys were working for 30 years, you know, Thurgood Marshall, most notable among them, basically founded Howard Law School to come up with a legal strategy so that they could take down Plessy v. Ferguson and desegregate public schools. Um, uh, and then Jim Crow effectively. And uh, that's not what happens here. There was nobody who decided, you know, my book starts in 1990 in, in Honolulu, Hawaii, and it's not because anybody sat down or there was some meeting of big figures and they said, we want to have a goal of legalizing same-sex marriage nationwide. Um, you know, it, when the book starts, there's not a single gay rights group in the United States that has endorsed marriage as an objective. There is barely a politician in the United States that's been asked for his or her opinion on marriage. There is no sense of unanimity, even among gay rights litigators, that this is a desirable outcome, let mm -hmm. alone a gettable outcome on, on any timetable. And, um, and then and also opponents of gay rights are, are fighting all sorts of forms of, of equality for, for uh, uh, LGBT people, but they're not trying to stop gays and lesbians from marrying because there's no active that effort is, to get them to marry, right? This isn't and, even thought about, right? Yeah, and so, you know, you know where you started introducing this is, is six years ago at the Supreme Court, and I think that there is a natural impulse that when um, something 
like this ends at the Supreme Court and we have, there's a, a, a landmark opinion that, you know, immediately extends a set of rights or freedoms or liberties to a class of people who had been denied them, um, uh, that we assume it was, because the outcome was just, we assume it was inevitable. And part of what comes through and, you know, came through to me in the, in the research and reporting of this book, and I hope comes through to readers, is like, no part of this was inevitable. It, not just that there are certain strategic and tactical choices that folks on all sides of this issue made at various points that, determine how and when it could get to the Supreme Court for that type of resolution, but it wasn't inevitable that we that this was going to be the gay rights issue that we were fighting over uh, uh, during our lifetimes. And how important was timing to the 2015 uh, decision? Um, th th that it was that case? Uh, if it had come at a different time, would it have made a difference? I, mean, I think there's a real question if the court as comprised today, um, heard the Obergefell case, would it have ended up where it did? And there, there are a lot of counterfactuals in there, you know, yeah. um, but, but, you know, certainly Anthony Kennedy being the fifth vote on that court, Kennedy who had already written three landmark gay rights opinions, um, uh, um, you know, being the fifth vote on that court as opposed to it being, being um, Kennedy or, or, uh, uh, someone else, Gorsuch, w was sort of important. Um, the, uh, you know, by the time, I think that there's sort of like, the, in the short term, the court was sort of jammed by the time that it said that it would hear the appeals on Obergefell because it had, you know, an, a, a number of circuits had already heard, had already ruled on the, the constitutionality of these state bans. They had been struck down at the circuit level, and then and and the losers, states that wanted to maintain their bans on same-sex marriage, appealed to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, "We're not going to, we don't want to hear this." And in many cases, then states started marrying same-sex couples. So there were probably tens of thousands of couples in the United States who had gotten married with the uh, uh, sort of tacit acceptance of the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court said, "We don't think we need to hear a challenge this." And it was only when there was a split in the circuits that um, that these cases from Ohio, Michigan, uh, Tennessee, and Kentucky uh, were appealed to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, basically, we have to hear this because we're the one who, who, who resolves splits among the circuits. And so at that point, you know, th this was a weird decision in that among like landmark decisions, it was eagerly awaited, you know, immediately the historic importance of this was known, but there was very little suspense about it. I have no idea what the conversations were like at, at, at CNN that morning, but like there was hardly anybody on any side of this issue or observers who was not entirely confident that this was going to turn out the way it ended up turning out. And part of that was because the court had sort of tipped its hand by not hearing challenges uh, uh, to it earlier. And, and talk about what we saw in the 1980s, two ascendant movements, one of which was the gay rights movement, but also the religious right, the uh, traditionalist Christian movement. You think about figures like Pat Robertson and, and Jerry Falwell. Uh, why was it important that those two movements uh, were rising at the same time to this, to this outcome? Yeah, so, you know, I think that the, that the timing of the rises is almost coincidental, you know, the gay rights movement, obviously people look back at Stonewall as a trigger of it. it's not really until the late 70s, mid to late 70s that, that, the, that the gay rights movement starts to get any form of political institution, sort of um, organizations, interest group type structure, professionalizes, starts to get uh, the beginning of funding. Um, and that's right around the same time that, that evangelicals are entering politics, uh, 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 that that some combination of a backlash to Roe v. Wade of the uh, opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment um, uh, are are unifying the religious right, and we end up in the '80s, and both of these organizations are becoming professionalized, nationalized, and 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 funded, and um, they were basically built to fight with each other. And it is, um, you know, I, I think often we we think about political conflict as though politicians and interest groups um, uh, emerge to satisfy a popular demand around a certain issue. And I would sort of think of that as like a, a, a demand side explanation that there's like, there's public demand for movement on, I don't know, climate change or an opposition to 
critical race theory or to stop the war in Iraq or like whatever it is. And then politicians and interest groups and lobbyists and the sort of infrastructure of campaigns comes to support that public demand. Mm -hmm. What sort of became clear to me in, in, in writing this is like, is what I guess I would think of as the supply side explanation for this, which is like these groups had been built. They, and if you were an interest group, you need to justify your existence by through conflict. Your donors want conflict, your constituents want conflict, um, the, the, the media rewards conflict, and um, they were on a trajectory against one another. The, the religious right as it was constituted in the late 70s, 1980s was not, there were all sorts of anti-gay efforts, but it was not uniquely focused on gay rights. Um, but as the gay rights movement emerged, it became even more, their oppo opponents became even more focused on the gay rights movement. And, and the timing just happened to be that there's, there's this um, landmark case in, in Hawaii that I write about the Hawaii Supreme Court becomes the first court on earth to rule that the fundamental right to marriage could extend to same sex couples. And it is at a moment when, you know, the gay rights movement is, is well established by this point in Washington, has the ear of, of Democrats on Capitol Hill, the religious right is well established, has the ear of the Speaker of the House um, and uh, and the Senate Majority Leader who's going to run for president, and they are built to fight over slang. And the Defense of Marriage Act is almost like the natural conflagration that comes um, uh, when these two forces uh, uh, end up on a trajectory against one another. Talk about the role of money. We, of course, know money so important in political movements, uh, in grassroots movement. What role did it play in this fight for and against same-sex marriage? Yeah, you know, so a um, so there were are I think thirty six states that uh, banned same-sex marriage through ballot measures. Um, ballot measures are notable, um, you know, for people who pay attention to money in politics. Um, the the they're not regulated typically like candidate campaigns. Um, uh, and so there is, um, and there have been some court decisions about them treating this them as 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 a form of speech as opposed to of, of political activity. It's a long way of saying that um, amounts of money uh, can be spent on these ballot measure campaigns that cannot be spent on candidate campaigns. There can be direct donations from uh, uh, even pre-Citizens United from, um, uh, uh, entities in, 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 in amounts that are unfathomable in most state and all federal elections. And so you get, that's why you get, you know, massive volumes of money that can be spent on these, on these issue campaigns. And in 36 of them or something, um, 36 states that consider this, the, the, uh, folks opposed to same-sex marriage won, uh, every one of them. And in almost every instance had more resources than their opponents. And, um, you know, that was coming from a con a b both some of these institutions of the religious right focus on the family, American Family Association, um, but also just large conservative donors, um, uh, a number of whom had, had ties to, to various churches um, who, who would give six figure contributions to, to, to these issues in their states. Um, a few things happen that, that changes that, that uh, change that dynamic. One, you get the emergence of a, a handful of, of of gay donors, uh, almost exclusively white men, who, um, uh, led by Tim Gill, who was the founder of Quark uh, Software, um, uh, who sold his company like right before the, uh, you know, as the Nasdaq was booming in the late '90s, came away with um, some large share of a billion dollars, and has given you know a big part of it to LGBT causes in the last 20 years. And he developed a circle of donors, a couple of other people who made their money through tech, um, some people who had inherited it. Um, but as, you know, uh, they were focused on marriage more above every other issue on the sort of LGBT agenda. And, um, you know, I think that there is, one way to think about that is that, you know, the, there's definitely a class dynamic to, to fighting the fight mm -hmm. for marriage rights. I, I think it's a little and a more race dynamic too, which it, it, overlaps with class. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and I think it's more complicated than, than some of the, you know, I think that there's now a reflex that this is a rich person's right issue. Um, uh, and I think it's, it is uh, one way to think about it is that during the years where gay couples were, could not win marriage, le marriage rights legally, but were wanted the, uh, uh, some of the protections and rights and benefits of marriage, a lot of couples found that you can um, 
uh, contract, you know, through private contracts, basically recreate the legal structure of marriage. Obviously, it doesn't do anything for the symbolic and emotional meaning of, of, of having your relationship validated by the state, but that you could figure out how to transfer property. You could figure out how to get power of attorney. You could figure out how to you put adopt your, your partner. Uh, yes, right. Adopt. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and what that meant is that for you know middle class and certainly upper middle class folks who were focused on that goal, they could hire the lawyers who could. You just put your money in a trust. You could do everything. You could figure out how to do it all, and basically end up at the same point that you would be if you were married. That that if you are at the bottom of the socioeconomic stratum and you cannot go hire lawyers and you're not going to set up a trust and, but you can't in, naturally inherit your spouse's pension or your part, sorry, your partner's pension when, when he or she dies. Um, obviously that doesn't solve your problems. Um, and at the top of the socioeconomic stratum, um, the, uh, they could contract all of that stuff out except for the estate tax ex exemption. And if you are to use a technical term, filthy rich, um, you spent a lot of time thinking about estate planning. And I think, you know, these were men who, many of them had founded their own or ran their own companies. They were not concerned about employment discrimination. You know, they bought mansions in whatever city they felt comfortable living in. They weren't worried about housing discrimination. Some of them had private security. They did not worry about being victims of hate crimes or gay bashing in the street. But for them, the civil rights issue that they felt most immediately was, I have a lot of money and I want to leave it to my partner. And I don't, the government's going to take more of it than they would if I were straight. And let me go do something about that. And so this circle of donors ends up, you know, both putting a lot of money into marriage advocacy over the 2000s, changes, does a lot of research that changes the way these campaigns are run, the way people talk about marriage in the campaigns, changes the structure of them. So they're no longer dependent on these often small, underfunded local state groups to run these ballot measures, but are doing being done by national groups. But also more importantly, within the movement, moves marriage up the list of priorities because groups like the Human Rights Campaign or the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force or Equality California or whatever that, that had not, not made a priority out of marriage, all of a sudden saw that some of the biggest donors in the movement wanted to put money into that. And they said, well, we go where the money is. So that's happening on one end. And then the other thing that happens concurrently to that is starting in 2008, you have a, a sort of wave of boycotts and sort of online shaming efforts. Um, that were facilitated by the internet in a way that could not have been done so quickly and effectively and efficiently. And what happens between 2008 and 2012 is gradually a lot of the major donors, individuals, institutions that had been funding uh, anti-gay marriage advocacy basically walk away from the fight. And they, you know, I quote Frank Schubert, who was the campaign manager for all four of the anti-gay marriage ballot measures in 2012. He said, we had trouble getting donors to give because they were afraid that once their name ended up on a disclosure form, they would become the object of, of, of this type of shaming. And so- Well, known as cancel culture, right? I think you wrote exactly. about this in the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and by that point, what's happened also is that is a gay marriage has become an issue that it's not just a priority for large gay donors, but- uh, you know, major straight, it becomes something that traditional center left progressive donors like Mike Bloomberg and, and Jeff Bezos are giving money to, to gay marriage causes and also a number of prominent conservative. I write about the uh, Paul Singer, who's a hedge fund investor in New York, whose son came out as gay. And all of a sudden, you know, he's down the line conservative on every single issue you can imagine except LGBT rights. And that's because it's personal for him. And he got a whole bunch of other Wall Street people to start giving. And so you just get this massive shift in the resource game um, uh, in the years that this starts to move closer to the Supreme Court. And we're going to take questions if you want, if you all want to put them in the question and answer box. We're going to get to those uh, shortly. I want to ask you, what are the lessons that other movements that are, uh, you know, in the fight now, particularly you think about what's going on with transgender uh, rights, transgender youth in different states being banned from participating uh, in, girl in girl sports uh, specifically, what are the lessons from this fight that can be learned for the transgender fight or any other fights? Yeah, you know, I mean, one thing that's important is recognizing that, you know, probably the largest engine of the social change around, you know, not just marriage, but gay rights generally was people coming out. Um, and 
Uh, you know, we see from a lot of research that the best predictor of an individual's attitudes, of liberal attitudes on, on, on gay rights issues is how somebody answers the polling question. Do you have a friend, family member, coworker who's openly gay or lesbian? And, you know, when this was first asked, I think in 1983, it was 20 something percent said yes. And now it's, you know, close to a hundred. Um, and attitudes have moved on attitudes on policy questions like marriage have moved in, in, um, in tandem with that. And one thing, and, and that's sort of organic. And, you know, I, I'll presume that the percentage of, of people in the U S population are, that, that are gay or lesbian is probably exactly the same as it was in 1983. But the difference is that, you know, unlike race or sex, um, or to some degree, religion, people can control the conditions under which they acknowledge, disclose, announce, um, uh, who they are, and uh, that that ends up, we know, being a driver of opinions of their families and their communities, and 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 you know, like, I I I don't know if this is a, a profound or obvious observation, you know, like, uh, uh, gay and lesbian people are almost by definition born to straight people, um, mm -hmm. and so there's a sort of natural um, uh, persuasive power that 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 cycle has when. Uh, gay folks, uh, you know, uh, uh, people when well, people become public about their sexual orientation or gender identity in their communities, and that and that moves people around them, and and that's happening in a way that's that is or you know organically distributed, you know, like I guess to state the obvious, like there are not a lot of African American kids being born to white parents, there are not a lot of immigrant kids being born to native born parents, there are not a lot of you know catholic kids being born to evangelical parents whatever it may be um and so that has been a huge engine in this and i assume will be an engine of of uh change around trans issues one thing though that we did see uh and a lot of this was based on the research that was funded by um by uh some of those donors i was talking about in the period 2010 11 12 there becomes a real focus on figuring out how can we take advantage how, how can we try to basically package the power of, of people knowing somebody who's gay or lesbian into a campaign structure. And, you know, what I sort of show in the book is, is people restructure the advertising they're doing in these fights so that they start actually putting gay and lesbian uh, 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 families um, uh, front and center in ads, which had not been the case before, mm -hmm. or have straight people talking about why gays and lesbians want to marry, which had not really been um, uh, the focus of a, lot, of a lot of the messaging. Um, and then trying to adjust the the field programs of these campaigns so that phone banks and door knocking campaigns are encouraging these volunteers folks who are gay or lesbian or have a gay or lesbian family member to open up these you know long and often uncomfortable conversations with strangers that are dis designed to sort of personalize the communications of this campaign and a lot of that goes against the instinct of campaigns and we and, and you know i've seen and, and written a little bit about uh, uh, people trying to do this with with trans advocacy uh, and other issues as well. But can you figure out a way to sort of accelerate the natural organic power of people getting to know, in this case, a trans person and understanding why they want to be able to, I don't know, use the bathroom that 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 um, they feel comfortable with, or they want to play sports, or whatever the actual sort of policy issue is. Um, to what extent can you package that so that you're not just waiting for society to change organically as people come out? You know, the other thing I think just worth keeping in mind. I, I don't know if there's a potted lesson in this, but but people doing advocacy around around gender identity issues to just keep in mind. It really became clear to me, and you know, I, I went back and consumed a lot of media coverage from the '90s um, uh, in in researching this and. In almost everything that was written, uh, there was, uh, you know, in the 90s, like in Time or Newsweek about, about any gay rights issue, there was like always a paragraph that was like, you know, to be sure, we don't know whether homosexuality is a result of nature or nurture. Scientists <laughs> differ, blah, blah, blah. And like that disappeared, right? Yeah. Like we just stopped talking that way. Um, people stopped saying lifestyle. I mean, even folks who are like aggressively anti-gay in their politics don't talk about it as a lifestyle or a choice or suggest that that if, you know, if you let gays and lesbians marry, it's like incentivize people to become gay or whatever, which is people said this stuff in the 90s, right? Yeah, yeah, and, um, and the basic reality is that we have as a society come to accept that a whole lot of stuff 
that we're born with a whole lot of stuff as individuals that we can't control. And it's not just how we talk about, about sexuality, it's how we talk about uh, addiction and temper and a whole bunch of other human attributes. And that is downstream from laboratory findings yeah. that then sort of percolate into a broad cultural understanding of who we are and how we end up being where we are. But fundamentally, the debate over gay marriage changed from, is this going to encourage people to be gay? To what do we do with people who are gay in a, in a, in a fair society? And I suspect that our understanding as a society of, of the, the biological origins of gender identity are going to change in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, the way they did mm -hmm. over marriage in a similar span. And that the, the political debate is going to be very different as we shift our kind of lay person's understanding of the science here. And one of the things we talked about before we got on camera here was the idea that with the same sex marriage fight, straight people were really never convinced that they would have to give something up if two women got married or two men got married. There was, you know, the sort of defense of marriage, it wasn't a huge cause of, of straight people. Whereas with transgender people, we were talking about this, there is this idea that, my goodness, like, you know, they, they might ruin my girl's soccer team or something like that. You sort of liken the fight against transgender uh, rights within the realm of sports to the fight uh, around segregation in schools. Yeah, I, I think it's just worth always thinking on these issues. What What is the majority or, or you know, being asked to give up? Um, yeah. and, and, you know, one of the things to know about marriage is that there wasn't anything that, you know, you and I were talking about, there's not a limited number of marriage licenses in a given state, for example. Um, uh, you know, maybe that's why it was pretty easy to get a, you know, a lot of Republican senators to vote to make Juneteenth a national holiday, um, <laughs> but a lot harder to get them to move on a voting rights issue or on reparations or something where there is a sense that we have to give something up to acknowledge the thing that we want to, that we're doing here. And, um, and the politics of that then becomes just like really different. And I think it's, it is, um, uh, you know, it is important to, let's note that, you know, the Defense of Marriage Act passes in overwhelmingly in 1996 on the same day that the Employment Non-Discrimination Act fails in the Senate by one vote. We're now 25 years later, activists are still trying to pass, you know, the Equality Act, which is sort of the, the updated, more expansive version of, of ENDA, but there still has been no uh, uh, expansion of um, non-discrimination in federal statutes, uh, uh, no movement in Congress fundamentally yeah. on this in, in, in 25 years. Um, and there's been this massive movement on marriage in the military. Um, and in those cases, it, it, it was gays and lesbians basically fighting for admission into an institution that um, frankly, straight Americans no longer were that eager to be part of, um, institutions that arguably demand more people who join them than, than, um, than offer in, in sort of direct rewards. Uh, and that, you know, where there's not a competition for places and you look at, mm -hmm. at the non-discrimination laws and, and they, you know, I think there's a, a, a view among opponents of it that this somehow, I mean, it does like it, it constrains who you have to serve in your business and who you have to let into your school and who you have to rent your home to and who you uh, have to do business with. And that, that is seen as a, as a constraint. And I think it's just worth, you know, I think that, that we, we have civil rights fights that are both debates over public values, fairness, equality, liberty, justice. Um, but then also under, underneath them, there's like, they're actually like material, often scarce material resources that are being contested. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's notable that there has been more traction on the trans stuff on the ones where it's here's an institution that, it, that you are invested in, you yeah. parents, um, straight parents, uh, that's going to change as opposed to stuff like, you know, names on driver's licenses, um, <laughs> where there's not the same sense of ownership uh, uh, from from sort of the majority. Yeah, no, it's, an, it's an important point. So we're going to move on to audience questions. We've got a question from Kelly Wright. Could you speak about the razor thin margin of Obergefell, which was a 5-4 decision? Recently, Justice Alito blasted the opinion in a talk to the Federalist Society. Do you have any concerns about the newly cemented conservative court revisiting it? I don't know anybody on any side of this issue that, that so you know, we're like 50 years after Roe v. Wade and um, 
pretty quickly after Roe, at least as, after it became clear that Congress was not going to amend the Constitution to protect unborn life, that there would be a long effort to try to get the Supreme Court to revisit its core holding in Roe. I do not know anybody on any side of this marriage issue that sees a movement, anticipates a movement to get the Supreme Court to revisit its core holding on Obergefell, which is that the fundamental right to marriage applies to same-sex couples. Um, what we have seen are, so I, I, I think that regardless of the composition of the court, I think there are a lot of reasons, but you know, one big one is the court does not regularly revisit its decisions without, you know, a, a whole lot of reason to do so. And I think it would be, it would introduce a lot of chaos for couples, not just couples that got married in this period, um, but couples that chose not to get married in this period expecting, you know, I think courts like to be a source of stability and predictability in society and, mm -hmm. and going back and saying, hey, six years ago, we, we got this one wrong is, is something that justice on both the left and the right would be wary of, of, of being part of. Um, what we have seen, obviously, is, is several challenges that have made it to the Supreme Court uh, that, that are, are trying to push how far the court will allow private actors to uh, uh, discriminate um, against uh, gay married couples on the basis of religious objections. And um, obviously there's one that, that went to the court that wasn't really dealt with on the merits a couple of years ago uh, about a Colorado baker who didn't want to ba uh, bake a wedding cake for, for a gay couple. Um, uh, the one that the Supreme Court just dealt with this month, um, uh, uh, there was a Philadelphia uh, social service agency yeah. that wouldn't place foster children with, with gay and lesbian parents. And I, I, you know, I think the court, this court has showed itself to be very receptive to these religious liberty, mm -hmm. religious freedom claims. I think we're at the beginning of probably a number of these cases where we see how far they will go in allowing private actors who have a religious justification for it to treat different types of couples differently. And I can imagine we end up in a situation where maybe something similar to the Hobby Lobby case, which was about contraception a year ago, uh, like 10 years ago, um, uh, where a company says our board or shareholders or owners or whatever have a religious objection to, to same-sex marriage. So we will give maternity leave to uh, hmm. the opposite sex spouses of our, of our employees and we'll give dental coverage to the opposite sex spouses of our employees, but we won't give it to same-sex spouses. And could we end up in an area where the Supreme Court does not revisit the idea that every couple has an equal right to get married in the United States, but decides basically that private actors can get a whole lot of leeway about which marriages they want to uh, yeah. uh, treat how and effectively devalue the place of marriage, the, the, the public and premature of marriage in society as a result. No, yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, Mike O'Neill, my perception, perhaps incorrect, is that race was the focus of the culture wars during the 2020 election and that marriage rights were not. Why was this not a wedge issue? And I think, you know, 2020, 2016, probably. Yeah. Was yeah. yeah. 2016 is what really surprised me, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I'd expected if you would talk, look, we're going to look back at June 2015. In, in American history textbooks or whatever at two major events that happened that month, right? On June 26th, as you mentioned, the Supreme Court uh, rules in Obergefell, makes gay marriage the law of the land. On June 15th, 2016, Donald Trump, as he likes to say, came down the escalator in Trump Tower and announced his campaign for president. If you had told me before that, that within 11 days of one another, you would have a major landmark uh, Supreme Court opinion that extended civil rights to an unfavored minority um, uh, striking down bans that 13 of the most conservative states in the country had passed through their own political processes, forced upon them by justices in Washington. Uh, and, you know, I, I think I fair to say the most talented demagogue in modern American history announces his campaign for president. Um, uh, then I would have assumed that those things would be really related in, in some, you know, potentially scary and dangerous ways. And what is remarkable is how they were not. And, you know, I, I think that there are a few reasons for this. One is opponents of same-sex marriage. You know, there was a brief flare-up during that summer. You know, Kim Davis, who was the mm -hmm. county clerk in, in Kentucky, um, uh, let herself be jailed for refusing to issue licenses to same-sex. I believe she was Pentecostal, said it objected with her, her religious faith. Um, Ted Cruz, Rick Santorum, I think Mike Huckabee went down for... 
a day to stand by her side, but like it fizzled out as an issue afterwards. I thought there'd be hundreds of Kim Davises yeah. like around the country and that, and that they would get a lot more support from Republican elected officials. Um, you know, I think a couple things happened. One, gamers activists knew that they were going to lose Obergefell. It was not a shock. And they had already begun to pivot even before then to two things we've already talked about. One, to the religious liberty, religious freedom exemptions, which were basically saying we've lost the broader war to define the law as we see fit. And now we want to use the courts because we can't get our way through legislatures or the political process anymore. We need the courts to, to shelter us as a, as a minority that, as a besieged minority that cannot get its way through, through politics. Um, and then moving to trans issues where public opinion was just far more, far closer to where it had been on marriage 20 or 30 years earlier. Um, and where they are, were, were, could go on offense from some position of, of, of strength in terms of public opinion. And then I do think one big part of it is just like Donald Trump had has a remarkable instinct gift for um, uh, passion for pitting Americans against one another on all sorts of identity lines. And um, we can have to do another session later in which we, we, we try to psychoanalyze why this may be so, but like who you have sex with does not seem to be a big occupation of Donald Trump's when he's he's uh, <laughs> judging you. And he decided to make to you know to go after Muslims and Mexicans and immigrants and women and but, and yeah, and he knows yes. right. But if he had wanted to ringlead a uh, uh, backlash to Obergefell or to to gay marriage generally, I suspect. Um, things would have been very different in 2015. Other candidates would have been forced to meet him um, on that. The media would have covered it. What's remarkable, um, you know, fall of 2016 rolls around. Uh, there are four debates, three presidential, one vice presidential debate. This landmark Supreme Court decision that took place less than a year and a half earlier does not get brought up once. And it just disappears as an issue. Um, and, it, and it's true. Um, you know, I think that, that, if, if sexual politics were dro drove the sort of most of the culture war battles of uh, uh, certainly the 90s and 2000s, that race and ethnicity and, and uh, maybe national origin are driving the culture war battles now. And I don't know how much of that is um, unique to the, like, frankly, personal passions of Donald Trump. And you touched on this a bit. Uh, Greg Blonder asked, aren't social trends a contributing effect? For example, Glad raising the profile of gays in media and the fact that everyone, regardless of politics, has a gay child or friend. So the controversy no longer aligned personal interests with party. Yeah, you know, so I think that there is some sort of cycle here that's hard to disentangle, but social acceptance, which is driven by pop culture, the arts, seeing- Ellen you know, DeGeneres, all these you folks, yeah. Know, a Los Angeles Raiders football player coming out as gay, like whatever. Mm -hmm. social Queen Latifah, yeah. who yeah. knew? Social acceptance leads to individuals feeling comfortable coming out as gay within their personal lives, within their communities. That leads to a, a, a change in attitudes among the people around them, their friends, family members. Leads to more cultural acceptance, more people come out, leads to attitudes and, and you get into a, a sort of virtuous cycle. Um, uh, and I think that that probably putting too much unique emphasis on any part of that cycle doesn't do justice to the way that 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 things uh, intersect. But like clearly what's happened in, in the last 25 years is that, you know, being gay or lesbian has not become other in the way that it was you know, in the early 1990s. And one thing about marriage as a policy demand is that it is a very accessible, understandable, arguably conservative aspiration for people. And so, you know, people know, come to see that they have gays and lesbians in their lives and that they want to get married for the same reasons that straight people want to get married. And it's, it is, I think once, you know, the big, the big occasion in all this was May 17th, 2004, when gay and lesbian couples are able to start getting legally married in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Before that day, folks could, you know, warn some like wildly apocalyptic stuff was going to follow the end of the American family, the decline yeah. of Western civilization. It didn't happen. Even the biggest opponent of same sex marriage cannot come up with a particularly good case for anything bad that happened after gay couples were able to legally marry. And once you get past that, then it becomes a question of 
okay, we accept that they're gay people, we accept that they are born gay, um, and we accept that their aspiration to be married is actually not particularly transgressive. Mm -hmm. um, now what do you as a society it costs do? us nothing as well yes. if, yeah. if you're straight uh, another question my husband and i have been together for 28.5 years and married for six years now that we have marriage equality it seems that fighting employment discrimination would seem to be the next logical most needed step forward so i'm curious from your perspective what is the next focus as we continue the march to full lgbt uh, equality i mean here's i think a place where that the, the lgbt coalition has divergent interests and it is important to recognize that, you know, going, and one thing you see in, in my book is going back to the eighties, there's a real divergence between lesbians and gay men over their interests in family law, interests in, in end of life issues. You know, gay men were dying because of AIDS. Hmm. Lesbian women were not dying because of AIDS in the eighties. Lesbian women had biological children that they needed to fight for in court. Gay men did not have biological children that they needed to fight for in court. So, you know, the LGBT, you know, during Pride Month, I, you know, we especially, I think we see them as, as united in all sorts of ways, but I think it's important to realize that they have not oppositional political interests, but they definitely have divergent priorities. I think for gays and lesbians and, and, and bisexual people, um, the sexual orientation part of this, there are still a, a number of states um, uh, where it is legal to make hiring or firing decision or promotion decisions at the workplace, decisions about who you'll sell your house to or rent to, decisions about who you'll serve in your restaurant, decisions about who you as a bank will give a loan to, decisions about who you will admit to your school, that it, where it's perfectly legal to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation without having to even come up with, you know, some cover story or something for it. Um, that, uh, um, uh, and the Equality Act, which has passed the House and is, is in theory, awaiting movement in, in, in the Senate, in which Joe Biden w says he'll sign if, if, it, if it passes, would write that into federal law so that, that yeah. folks in states where there's not going to be movement on the state level would, would have uh, basic protection under the Civil Rights Act and some elsewhere in federal statutes. Um, I think trans folks have a different set of concerns, um, as uh, you know, we talked about some of them, um, some of them having to deal with health care, some of them having to deal with the fact that we do have, you know, a lot of different types of single sex institutions um, uh, that, you know, were frankly not built for an era in which people's notions of gender and sex did not align and figuring out how you uh, uh, integrate transgender adults and children for full participation in those institutions requires, requires, you know, uh, uh, some policy changes if, if people aren't going to be doing it at, at, the, at the at the private level. So, you know, I think that there are, um, uh, and then there are a lot of places where, you know, I think basic material needs for, for um, uh, uh, gay and lesbian, uh, transgender folks, as, as, you know, especially those with lower socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. people of color for healthcare, hate crime, stuff like that still seems real. And some of that can be dealt with through the law and some of that, um, uh, I, I'm not sure it's a matter of extending legal protections, but is a matter of you know public resources and, and attention by those in government. The fight for equality continues. Sasha Eisenberg, we thank you so much uh, for joining us today for your time. His book, you all should pick it up, The Engagement, America's Quarter Century Struggle Over Same-Sex Marriage. Um, and I'm gonna, a quick note from the Brennan Center before we leave you. You can stay up to date on key issues impacting our democracy with weekly analysis and insight from Brennan Center experts. You can sign up uh, for the briefing newsletter at brennancenter.org org slash briefing. The Brennan Center looks forward to seeing you at the next event and be sure to register at brennancenter.org slash events. Again, thank you all for coming. Sasha, fantastic. Thank you much, uh, so much for your hard work on this landmark book. Good luck going forward. Thanks, Nia. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye.